Some people believe that the Idaho Four crimes were committed by one single individual. And some people believe that there were multiple attackers in these crimes. Let's talk about both sides. Hey everyone, it's Lucky with Unfiltered Lucky. And tonight I want to talk a little bit about two theories. One theory being that one single suspect, Brian Koberger, took the lives of four University of Idaho college students with a sharp-edged blade in less than 10 minutes. The second theory is that there were multiple attackers and that the scenario was a lot different than just one individual entering a house and taking these students' lives. Now, first, I think that it's important to look at the nature of these crimes. The nature of these crimes is going to tell us a lot about the individual or individuals who committed these crimes. Now, we know that there were four suspects and that they were on two separate floors. We know that all of their lives were taken with a sharp-edged blade. Now, we also know that these crimes were very brutal. We know that whoever committed these crimes attacked these victims in an extremely violent manner. All, of, all four of these victims had multiple multiple injuries, some more than others. So it was reported that one of the victims had over 50 puncture wounds, 50 pun puncture wounds. So this crime really doesn't appear as a crime in which someone is breaking into a house or entering a house with the sole intention of taking someone's life or taking multiple lives. The manner in which these victims' lives were taken suggests that it was a very personal crime that this was a very up close and personal way in which whoever did this, whoever committed these crimes took their lives. This wasn't a crime in my opinion in which someone was coming into the house just to take someone's life. This is the type of crime in which the individual who committed these crimes didn't want to just take these victims' lives. They wanted to brutalize them. This, whoever committed these crimes, however many suspects there were, was not, wasn't in a hurry. These individuals who committed these crimes or individual, they stayed for a while. They inflicted a number of injuries. It wasn't an efficient type of crime. It wasn't the type of crime where somebody gets in and gets out. The, the individuals who committed this crime, they stayed a while. Now, we know that people's lives are taken every day. Every day, people's lives are violently taken. But not like this. This is different. The injuries were described as punctures, which would basically mean stab wounds. 
they weren't, they were described as not being slicing. But one of the descriptions of the wounds that tells us a lot is it was reported that the the wounds were comparable to ripping and tearing, tearing of flesh, which in my opinion would suggest that these victims were in motion. These victims were moving around. So, the PCA stated that these victims, they believed these victims were sleeping. But the manner of these injuries would suggest that these victims were very much awake. And moving. They were in motion while they were being attacked. Now, a lot of these crimes, a lot of what doesn't make sense when it comes to these crimes is the actual crimes themselves. These crimes, it's difficult to explain the magnitude of these crimes. Because we all watch movies, we watch TV, and we see violent acts. And, but we know this is a production. We know that this is a movie. We know that this is a TV show. But these violent acts occurred in real life. Something probably worse than a horror movie. These crimes were heinous. The crime scene was described as messy. And the type of crime scene that first responders and investigators had never seen in their lives This is a major, major crime. Not just anybody would have been able to commit this crime. So let's talk about Brian Koberger committing this crime as a single perpetrator. Now, Brian Koberger would have entered this house knowing that there were multiple individuals inside this house. Now, there's a lot of action happening around this house, even as late as 3, 3.15, 3.30 in the morning, approximately the same times that law enforcement believes that these crimes were happening. There's a lot of movement outside this house. As a matter of fact, law enforcement is right outside this house, pretty much. I mean, when these crimes began, there was a door dash order coming to the door. There were students walking around outside all over this area, which we saw from the Banfield footage. There was a lot of action around this area at three o'clock in the morning. So there was a lot happening. There had been a football game that night, so there was a lot of parties. There was parties in the surrounding apartments that surrounded the house at 1122 King Road. So there was a lot of action happening around this house for it being three o'clock in the morning. It would have been very strange for one individual to choose this time to enter this house and commit this crime. Because Brian Koberger would have been by himself. So he enters this house and he goes straight to the top level and takes Maddie's life and takes Kaylee's life. Inflicts multiple injuries, 
multiple injuries on both victims, many more injuries on Kaylee. So, Brian Koberger being upstairs by himself committing these crimes, he's left himself exposed because the roommates on the bottom two levels at this point could, there's no containment. These, these roommates could run out of the house. They could call 911. They could drive away from the crime scene if they wanted to. So it would seem very odd that one suspect whose intention was to enter this house to take someone's life or multiple lives would start at the top level. I don't see that happening. I just it just wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't it wouldn't make sense for 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 this suspect to to start at the top level. But they do say that he started at the top level. So after he takes Maddie's life and Kaylee's life, now he has struggled with Kaylee. So being that Brian Koberger has never committed a violent crime in his life that we're aware of, he would be extremely rattled at this point. He's just taken two lives with a sharp-edged blade up close and personal. This would be, this would be a mental overload for, for an individual who has never been in this type of environment, in this, in this type of criminal environment. It would be very difficult for, for Brian Koberger to do this by himself. He, he doesn't have anybody else there to motivate him, and, and, and I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Now, Brian Koberger, after he takes Maddie and Kaylee's life, heads downstairs and faces off with Ethan and Zanna. Now, Ethan is six foot four and an athletic young man. So this is going to cause a problem for Brian Koberger. He has no backup. So if he gets overcome, if Ethan is able to overtake him, then that's it. It's game over. This would be a, this would this plan would be horrible. This plan would be a terrible plan from the beginning. Now, then after Ethan, he moves on to take Zana's life. Now, Zana, we also know, fights back, but eventually he's able to overcome Zana and take her life. Now, at this time, he still, he's by himself. So he still doesn't know whether law enforcement has been called or not. He still doesn't know where the other two roommates are located. He doesn't know where they're at in this house because he's by himself. He doesn't have anybody to watch his back. And he doesn't have anybody to help him contain this crime scene I mean even if he had a second weapon let's say he did have a second weapon a more serious weapon a weapon that we don't talk about on this platform let's say he had this weapon as well as a sharp edged blade and he was using this other weapon to contain the other victims in the house the only way that that would really work is if all the victims were on the second floor. If everybody was grouped together at the same time, because these are th these are four victims on two separate floors. It for one individual to commit this type of crime, who's never committed a crime of this manner that we're aware of, has no history of violence. It would, it would be difficult. Now, we all know that Brian Koberger studies crime. That's what he does. 
his he's working on his PhD in crime, basically. So a lot of people would say, well, you know, he has knowledge of how to commit these crimes. Having knowledge of how to commit this type of crime definitely does not mean that he is going to have the guts to commit this type of crime. Not four times. You're talking about one individual taking the lives of four healthy young college students. No containment at all. No idea whether law enforcement is coming to the house. No idea of how this house is even laid out. So Brian Koberger would have extremely limited knowledge of, of these victims as well as this house. Now, if you've been watching my videos, then you already know that I do not believe that one suspect would have been able to commit these crimes. I, I just, in real life, I just don't believe it. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me that one individual with no history of violence could come into this house and take the lives of four young college students with a sharp-edged blade in less than 10 minutes. Not, not with the injuries, not with the amount of injuries to these victims. These victims had multiple, multiple injuries that would suggest that this suspect was not concerned about time. This suspect was not concerned about whether law enforcement was coming or concerned about being, you know, about retaliation from the other roommates. This, this suspect was not concerned about time, in my opinion. Now there's the other theory, that there were multiple attackers. To me, this theory makes a lot more sense. It makes more sense because multiple attackers would provide these perpetrators containment, containment within this house, because you have six people in this house. You would, these, these suspects would have to contain this crime scene and contain these roommates. So with multiple individuals, that would be a lot easier and it would make a lot more sense. Now, whether these multiple attackers were part of an organization, say, or that a fight broke out in this house and escalated to this level of violence, to me, that's, that's much more of a possibility than one individual coming into this house to take the lives of, of these four roommates because he was jealous of them or because he had a crush on one of them. He, Brian Koberger had only lived in Pullman, Washington for a few months. So he didn't have a whole lot of time to be stalking people and and getting to know these areas in order to stalk the girls in this house now let's get back to the multiple attackers it's very very possible that a fight could have broken out in this house and that the violence escalated it's also very possible that there was a group, we'll call it a group, of individuals who entered this house in order to seek vengeance 
And as I've said from the very beginning, send a message. I wholeheartedly believe that a lot of these crimes were a message, a message being sent to this community and to the public. And as, as I've said before, I believe that this message was well taken. Now, with multiple attackers, these suspects would have, they would be able to motivate each other. And when I say motivate each other, I mean, they, they, could, they would play off of each other. So while one attacker is committing this crime and doing this act, you have another attacker who sees this and it compels him to attack another victim and to take the life of another victim. It's, it's, it's a matter of numbers. So you have a number of individuals committing these crimes and you have a, a better idea, you have a better chance at containing six individuals inside this house. If you have two or three or more individuals committing these crimes, then you have an individual who can be containing this house, who knows that law enforcement is not being called. Now, when you have multiple attackers, you have, these attackers have the ability to watch each other's back. They have the, uh, they have the ability to play off of one another. There's plenty of people out there who will do dumb things to impress other people. So maybe one attacker is getting extremely brutal and another attacker wants to commit the same brutality. And so you have, you have attackers playing off of each other when you have multiple suspects. It's more of a group situation. Now, I believe it's very possible that these, these roommates, everyone in this house, knew these attackers. The eight-hour gap to call 911 after these crimes were committed, in my opinion, is an indication <clears throat> that these surviving roommates and these victims knew these attackers. Now, if this is just some strange guy that's in their house taking the lives of their roommates, I believe they call 911 immediately. But if this is a group of people who all of these roommates know and are familiar with, then maybe they don't call 911 because maybe, maybe they don't realize that the violence is going to escalate to this level. I, it makes more sense for there to be multiple suspects. It makes, it makes more sense to have more suspects to cover more ground and to motivate each other to commit these crimes. Now, we don't know, you know, they've given us an order in which they believe that these victims' lives were taken. But the only way they would really know that is by blood transfer. But if the same weapon, if there was multiple weapons used, they, they wouldn't be able to do blood transfer. Blood transfer information would only work if the same weapon was used. So that's the only way they would really know the order in which these victims' lives were taken. Now, I've heard people say, well, they would know by the, by the footprints of body fluid, 
because there would only be footprints coming down the stairs from Kaylee and Maddie's room. But there were multiple people in this house that morning, later on that morning, when the surviving roommates called people over to the house. So somebody walked upstairs to find Kaylee and Maddie. We don't know who that is yet. We don't know who found Kaylee and Maddie. But somebody or individuals had to go upstairs to find Kaylee and Maddie's bodies. And they would have had to walk upstairs through the crime scene. And then they would have had to walk downstairs. There would have been, there would have been footprints. There would have been bloody footprints all over this house. Because the suspect or suspects would also have, have tracked footprints throughout the house. So Maddie and Kaylee's body fluid would also be downstairs, on the floor downstairs, and possibly on the walls downstairs, being tracked from upstairs. But there were multiple people in this house later on that morning after these crimes occurred. The people that were called to the house by the surviving roommates. So there would have been footprints all over this crime scene. This crime scene was a mess from the very beginning because not only was the crime scene contaminated by all these people that came over that morning, but the victim's bodies were there for eight hours. Eight hours. So it would be very difficult for the coroner and the medical examiner to get a lot of the information that they would need if they had gotten the call in a more, you know, if they had gotten the call at 5 a.m. or 4.45 a.m. or, you know, seven and a half hours sooner. But that didn't happen. So, in my opinion, I don't believe that one suspect could have committed these crimes in this manner. I don't believe that one suspect could have inflicted this amount of damage on four separate victims with one sharp-edged blade in less than 10 minutes. I mean, I feel like that's almost an an insult to our intelligence. Because that doesn't make sense at all. Now, if these were multiple attackers in a house that they're familiar with, with victims and roommates that they're familiar with, that's a totally, that's a different crime than one individual breaking into this house to take someone's life. Multiple individuals in this house where they feel comfortable because they're familiar with this house and they have a knowledge of of all of the roommates in this house. Like I said in the beginning, in my opinion, the individuals who committed these crimes were not pressed for time. They weren't in a hurry. They weren't worried about working efficiently because they weren't worried about law enforcement showing up. They they were familiar with this house and they were familiar with these roommates. And that's why they were so comfortable taking their time. One single individual you know, in, inflicting over 50 wounds on one victim, one victim would be, would be very stressed out about time because this would take time. 
But these, the manner in which these crimes were committed does not appear to be someone who's concerned about time. This would take a certain individual to commit these types of heinous crimes. I believe that an individual who has no history of violence could possibly get into a position where he's going to commit these crimes. But once these crimes began, I, I, I don't believe that this suspect would have had the guts and the confidence to continue on with this crime. I just don't believe that. Real, this is re, reality. You're talking about four victims with multiple, multiple wounds, multiple wounds inflicted on them, up close and personal. This was a personal crime. I just don't, I just don't understand how Brian Koberger would have been able to motivate himself to commit these crimes. I don't, I don't believe that there's too many individuals who could commit this crime physically and mentally, emotionally. I don't believe there's too many people that could do this on their own. Multiple attackers makes more sense. It, you know, it explains a lot of the issues that a single attacker would have. The main issue would be containment, containing these six individuals inside this house, which I just don't believe that one person would be able to do. And as I said, that eight-hour gap in which it took time to call 911, to me, that's a big indicator that these surviving roommates knew these attackers. It just, if they didn't know this attacker and it was one single attacker they had never met in their lives, I believe that they would have called 911 right away. That's just my opinion. Stay tuned for my next video and please like and please subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate everybody who supports my channel and uh, interacts you know, with my comment section and shares information. I really appreciate it. We'll see you next time.